I'm rolling. Okay, we're going to look at another example of a limit of a multivariable function. So as before, we're going to think about the domain of the function. Um, not that it really asks us about that when we're thinking about this limit, but maybe to understand why this limit is something we would look at. So this function, uh, f of x, y is 5x squared y over x squared plus y squared. Uh, when you think about domain of a function that's written in this fraction form, you're really just going to be thinking about is there anything that would cause that denominator to be zero. Uh, so the domain of this function is all of R2 except any points that would make the denominator zero, which would be just the origin. So even if it didn't ask you about this limit, most of the homework actually specifies what limit it wants you to find for now. Um, but later, you should be able to look at a function and think about where are the relevant limits? Where should I be considering limits? So this is the only point excluded from the domain, so that would be where we would want to consider a limit. Um, it also means that we can't just plug in 0, 0 into this function. If I could, I wouldn't really need to be considering a limit here. Um, so, in the last video, we used a strategy for simplifying the function so that I could get some convenient cancellations and then I came up with a similar function, a function that was the same except at that point, and I was able to just plug in that point. That's not going to work here. We did some factoring in the last video and had a common factor of x squared plus y squared, but that's not going to happen here. I can't factor the numerator. Um, so sometimes I have students do some desperation algebra, but uh, you should convince yourself that whatever things you think you're going to cross out here don't really cross out. Uh, so kind of have to go to a different strategy here. So one way that might be helpful to think about what you could try here would be to think about what this is really asking. I'm going to draw a picture of the domain of this function. So the domain of the function is all of R2 except the origin. So everything in R2 except the origin. And I want to think about what happens when I take any path of approach toward the origin. Any path of approach toward the origin. And I want to think about what happens to the outputs of the function as I do that. And so when I draw this picture, it maybe is helpful to kind of see that uh, here I've got an xy coordinate system, but if I draw this, I don't have to be restricted to just using x's and y's. And in particular, since we're approaching the origin, uh, there may be a change of coordinate system that would be helpful to us here. So we can use xy coordinates if they are convenient, but you could represent the same geometry using other coordinate systems. So you can convert to polar coordinates. So you might remember conversion formulas for polar coordinates. X is R cosine theta. This would be from pre-calculus or trig. Uh, y is R sine theta. And X squared plus Y squared is R squared. So it's really just based on the definitions of sine and cosine and Pythagorean theorem. Um, but the helpfulness here is this relationship. If I make a conversion to polar coordinates here, you can see that in my denominator I'm going to get some nice simplification. And then the other important thing about polar coordinates is that for every path of approach, no matter where I'm coming in, every path of approach toward the origin, I'm going to be letting r approach 0, and theta can be everything. So lots of different values of theta for all different quadrants. And so I can handle many, many paths of approach uh, by just thinking about this. So there are two important things about this problem that make polar coordinates a great idea. One of them is that I have this x squared plus y squared, which simplifies nicely when I convert to polar coordinates. The other is that I'm approaching the origin. And when I approach the origin, uh, we can really just let r approach 0, and theta can be anything. So our angle can be anything, and we can handle all of the quadrants by just 
focusing on our R values approaching zero. Every path of approach toward the origin has to have R approaching zero. So I'm gonna convert this to polar coordinates and then we'll do the rest of the problem in polar coordinates. So equals, and since I'm gonna be using polar coordinates, I'm gonna, instead of having x, y approaches zero, zero here, I'm gonna use polar coordinates. I'm not gonna have r theta approaches zero, zero, because that would be emphasizing that theta is zero, but I wanna let theta be everything. So I'm just gonna let r approach zero. And then I need to make these substitutions into my function. So for x, I'll have r cosine theta, the quantity squared. For y, I'll have r sine theta. And in the denominator, you can make these substitutions and then simplify, but it's a little easier if you just use the Pythagorean uh, identity to simplify that denominator. As you do more of these problems, you might do more steps of simplification here in your head and do some steps as well, but I'm gonna go ahead and write out all the steps on this first one. All right, so when I simplify this numerator, um, I will have five and then I'll have an r squared times another r. So r cubed cosine squared theta sine theta. Don't forget that I have that squared. And then an r squared here on the denominator. Um, and remember when we did the previous problem, I had some nice simplification that happened when I did some factoring. Here, when I converted to polar coordinates, I get some nice simplification to happen. So just like we talked about in that prior video, when I do that cancellation, this simplified function is not really the same function as what we started with because it does not have the same domain. I'm also gonna do a little grouping here. All right, so I've got 5r, and then I've got my trig functions right here. Uh, and I'm gonna let r approach zero, and theta can be anything. So I kind of regrouped this here. So I have the part involving r, and then the part that does not involve r. As r approaches zero, this part here is going to be approaching zero. And so sometimes students think, well, zero times anything is gonna be zero, but that's not entirely true. Zero times infinity is not necessarily zero. That's an indeterminate form. So you need to think a little bit carefully about this. Uh, this part approaches zero, and then I need to think a little bit about this. Um, so no matter what theta is, no matter where we're at for any value of theta over here, cosine squared theta times sine theta will always stay finite. Or another way to say that would be to say that this part here is bounded because cosine theta and sine theta will always be between negative one and one. Any products of them will always be between negative one and one. So your textbook will talk about this staying bounded. So in essence, that means that that stays finite or this part is always between negative one and one. So because this part stays finite and is always between negative one and one, and then I'm gonna take that times this expression here that will approach zero, I will get that zero times something that stays finite will be zero. So this limit is zero. Okay, again, like we talked about in the previous video, that does not mean that there's a point at zero, zero, and the output is zero, but it means when our x, y point is close to the origin, the outputs of this function should be close to zero. So we'll go over and look at this on the computer. All right, here I've graphed our function, uh, x, z equals five x squared times y. I don't think I need a times there, but uh, times y over x squared plus y squared. And I just graphed this on the default window. Um, you might notice that there's some kind of sharp looking edges here. Uh, that's probably just an artifact of the computer. It's plotted 30 grid lines. That's just the default setting here. I'm gonna make it actually plot more so that it does a little bit finer plot. I'm gonna change this to 200. 
When I do that, it makes a lot of grid lines, so it's kind of difficult to look at. So I'm actually going to go over here to graph settings, and I'm going to choose uh, hide my edges. So I will just see the surface without all these grid lines on it. Um, so sometimes that makes it a little hard to look at at first, but now you can see with the colors it helps show a little bit what's going on here. So as I rotate this surface around and look at it, um, you can see that on all of these paths of approach, as XY is approaching the origin, the Z values appear to be approaching zero. Somewhere, some directions, they're approaching zero along a very flat path of approach toward the origin. And other places, it's very steep path of approach toward the origin. Those Z values, though, are all approaching zero. So there's not actually a point there at the origin. Again, it's hard for a computer to tell that unless you tell it specifically to plot a point at the origin. But what's happening here is it's plotted a bunch of points very close to the origin, and I've got Z values all the very close to zero there uh, at the origin. So a correct graph of this surface would include a little hole right there at the origin where there is no point. Remember that the domain of the function does not include zero, zero can't plug that in, so there should not actually be a point there, but there'd just be a little hole in the graph of the function at that point. Okay, we're going to look at some more videos where there's some more kind of crazy stuff going on with some of these limits, and we're going to look at some uh, graphs that have some really strange behavior uh, near the point that we're approaching, so be sure to watch those next couple videos because they're significantly different than these first two we looked at.